Salams from the People's Dispatch Studios in New Delhi. I'm Sinhan Thani. You're watching Daily Debrief. An analysis of reports on the Russia-Ukraine war continues to lead the rundown on the show today as Russian forces announce safe passage for civilians after claiming that they are closing in on three major cities in the country. The capital Kiev, the second largest city Kharkiv and the southern port city of Mariupol. The West has responded not by attempts to broker peace, but to further up the ante by tightening economic and other sanctions. We discussed yesterday how this is even playing out in sporting arenas and even fashion weeks around the world. We will have Prabir Purkayasta on the show in a short while for more on the economic fronts of the war. But first, Anish joins us with an update on the positions taken by major nations in what I think is referred to as the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Anish, first up, what are Japan and Australia saying? So beginning with Australia, uh, we need to understand that it has taken the most drastic step of an, for a non-NATO country. Because mm. if you look at it, the current conflict is between essentially NATO and Russia and Ukraine is in the middle of it. Uh, so NATO members sending uh, military aid was not uh, surprising in many ways. But when Australia uh, decided to do that and actually earmarked about 50, uh, 51 million dollars uh, worth of uh, funds for ammunition and specifically missiles. Uh, it it says a lot about how Australia is positioning itself in the in its uh, geopolitical uh, context. Mm. Uh, Japan, on the other hand, has taken a more usual uh, U.S. ally uh, role. It ha it is going to extend aid and loans to Ukraine for humanitarian assistance. That's what it says. Uh, and it will also be participating in the SWIFT ban and all the sanctions on Russian banks and transactions with Ru Russian banks. So in that sense, uh, while Japan would seem muted, I think the more uh, insidious part is what is happening inside Japan, mm. which is uh, now talks are emerging and the lead, which uh, unsurprisingly com is coming from uh, Shinzo Abe, mm. the former prime minister, mm. is the talks of uh, doing, uh, maybe debating, if not doing away, obviously that's the eventual conclusion for them, mm. but uh, debating the non-nuclear policy that they have, which is to not produce, possess or uh, allow nuclear weapons inside the country. Mm. And now they're talking about uh, a nuclear uh, weapon sharing agreement with the uh, United States. And a lot, uh, too many officials and senior members of the government and the ruling LDP has actually made the statement and uh, in you know this has been happening for quite a while but they are now finding this uh, sort of uh, using or exploiting this sort of popular anger against russia which is hap which is also happening in japan uh, being fed by all the nato warmongering mm. and propaganda mm. so they are definitely trying to make use of that uh, in a previous time uh, something like this would have been unthinkable for mm. most japanese and still is for a large part of the society but uh, now with Russia, uh, how it is portrayed as this uh, global villain, it has to be. It is now seen as this something, something very essential and existential for Japan. Mm -hmm. And especially considering the fact that it is also Japan is also kind of aligning with U.S. more and more recently against China in a very in its again geopolitical context that is emerging out of it. Let's bring South Korea into the into the picture next, Anish. Uh, what is the scenario there, and uh, the Conservative Party uh, taking taking a stance that clearly will take us a few steps back in terms of peace on the Korean Peninsula? Yeah, uh, and it is quite uh, disconcerting because we are looking at elections that are just days away. Uh, Korea will be electing its president and its house on March 9th, and uh, in that, if we are going to look at uh, victory for the conservative opposition led by the People Power Party, uh, it is going to ha really do, uh, really it will set back the entire peace process that has been happening under the presidency of Moon Jae-in. Mm. Uh, and it is quite a curious thing uh, because it is happening very simultaneously with what is also happening in Japan, if you think about it. Uh, the opposition candidate for the presidency you, uh, has actually made statements saying that he would uh, uh, expand the ballistic uh, capabilities and anti-ballistic capabilities of South Korea in alliance with the United States. It ha he has already called on uh, Joe Biden to send uh, more of the 
the THAAD missile systems right. into South <coughs> Korea, which is already deployed in South Korea, by the mm. way. Mm. Uh, so they want more. Mm. And they say, uh, they're already criticizing the peace process and like trying to portray uh, North Korea is just the same as uh, Russia. And because tensions are also, uh, like it simmers every now and then, as we know, mm. uh, because of various reasons. It's mm. not just one side acting yeah. out, right? Yeah. It's for various reasons. Uh, this kind of, they are exploiting that and the, again, as I said, like the NATO fed uh, popular anger against Russia in a, in a very, uh, in a propaganda style, basically, mm. to uh, exploit that for their election campaign. Mm. Because if you look at it currently, the entire election process in mm. South Korea, uh, it's, it's quite a polarized uh, election. And if, even opinion polls cannot really call the election because we are looking at margins as small as 1%, less than 1% in, in many cases. Right. So in such a situation, in such a scenario, uh, this polarization is going to definitely increase. The Democratic Party obviously wants to push forward the peace policy with North Korea. It wants to have a proper end to the Korean War, which mm. it technically is still on. on. And so an uh, end of war agreement is something that has been proposed, mm. something that has not happened because, again, United States has not been forthcoming when it comes to uh, commitments uh, that were required for peace yeah. uh, and more importantly uh, they are also not too keen on actually using South Korea mm. as a certain kind of lo probable launch pad in a possible conflict in the future mm. uh, for the United States mm. and so this we have also seen like cutting down of military drills cutting down of uh, a lot of other uh, privileges that the United States used to have under the under different conservative governments over the past. So this is kind of like at a, a, a crossroads for the region at large, if you look at it, because any return from whatever has been has gained, been gained. Yeah. in the peace process means that things are not going to look good for the region yeah. as a whole. And, and a very important and, and also uh, volatile region exactly, in, in yeah. many ways. Thanks for that update, Anish. Right. It will be interesting to see how all of this plays out in the context of the South Korean elections that are coming up. Uh, but we're moving on now and talking specifically about the economic uh, facets or economic front of the war. Uh, the announcements of boycotts and sanctions by various countries as well as individual corporations continued on Tuesday and Wednesday. Russia's biggest bank, Sberbank, announced its withdrawal from the European market following the European Union's demand. Companies that issue a credit, such as MasterCard and Visa, and several others also announced suspension of operations in Russia on Tuesday, adding to a long list of those who'd announced similar measures earlier. But before we get into uh, specific economic impacts of sanctions, I want to talk a little bit about the UN vote on condemning Russia's uh, war in Ukraine. And uh, for more on that, uh, we have with us Prabir Purkayasta, NewsClick's editor-in-chief. Uh, Prabir, 35 countries abstaining from that vote, a large number, and also some significant countries uh, in, in those that abstained. What do you make of overall the picture of who voted for, who abstained, and who voted, of course, against? This is a very interesting vote that you are talking about because normally you would not expect India, China, and Pakistan to vote together. All three have abstained. South Africa has also abstained. These are the out of five, the four BRICS countries have abstained. The only one which has not abstained has been Brazil. Brazil. But that we know Brazil has been very close to the United States and BRICS, in fact, is not working because of Brazil's role in this, in this uh, alignments. Mm. Now, of course, the UN General Assembly does not have any powers. It's really more an expression of what you feel as a country. Right. And it has, we know, that UN General Assembly, for instance, condemned South Africa for being an apartheid state. It had very few supporters. It made no difference to mm. South Africa mm. because the US, UK, France all supported it. Right. Uh, similarly, you know, at What's different Israel? points of time, Palestine, mm. uh, Israel, mm. these have been the most important issues. Again, right. made no difference to what the UN General Assembly says hmm. because ultimately what matters is the Security Council right. or the only ones who have power in that sense of intervening in a you know in an, a way that is consistent with international law right. and there of course the five Security Council members permanent, permanent members member. have a veto hmm. and that's what in this case also why no measure was passed to the Security Council just as measures 
passed against earlier South Africa, Israel again had no value because the U.S. consistently vetoed the law. Mm. So this is one part of the Security Council issue. I think what we have to see now, having the Security Council not take, being able to take action, what the, it seems to be now moving on to economic uh, front. What is the economic war which effectively the uh, European Union and of course the United States has unleashed now against Russia. Hmm. And I think that's going to be the one, apart from what happens in Ukraine itself, hmm. are, the, is, are the things that we need to watch. Right. So, Prabhupada, from, from a very layperson's sort of understanding of this, uh, instead of pushing for peace, this seems to be upping the ante, the economic sanctions is what I'm talking about when I say this. Uh, what are exactly the latest in the round of sanctions that we've heard of? And, and how do you perceive Russia as responding or what can Russia do in response? That's a very, very uh, difficult question to answer because we have been put in a completely uncharted territory on this. This kind of economic sanctions against an economic power of the size of uh, Russia, mm. we have not seen before. Iran was still relatively a small player yeah. in the international market, in the international financial system, compared to what Russia is. Mm. Russia has a huge foreign exchange reserve. Mm. Uh, something like $640 billion, part of it which it holds in gold, part of which it holds in uh, Chinese uh, renminbi as a currency. So that's a significant part of it, but about $400 billion equivalent are held in currencies and in assets which could be open to the sanctions that has just been levied on them. Mm. Now, it is not that these are being officially or technically expropriated. Right. What Russia is being told is that these cannot be used, mm. which is essentially a kind of frozen asset, but not expropriation. Mm. For all practical purposes, at the moment, the moment. they are not available to Russia. Yeah. Now, what happens to that, and this is a very, very large amount of money that we are talking about, is an open question. Mm. Of course, Russia has also said you cannot take out assets from Russia in dollars mm. or euros, any foreign currency. I think 80% only has to be left, only 20% can be withdrawn, mm. which means they are also threatening the technically, though it's not expropriation, mm. effectively you cannot repatriate means that they are also effectively frozen, frozen in Russia, that they are in your hands, but you can't take them out. Mm. So that is the reciprocal uh, part that they have uh, used. The other part of it, which is the SWIFT bank, there are eight banks which have been thrown out of the SWIFT system and they cannot make foreign exchange deals, any trade in foreign exchange, either buying or selling goods or buying and selling financial assets mm. of different kinds. Mm. Now, again, they, this does not involve the two banks which are largely used for gas, oil, and probably even coal, the energy uh, exports of Russia, which European Union, for instance, needs, as well as what uh, United, United States needs. Yeah. It needs heavy oil, which the only other source was heavy crude, which mm. the only other source was Venezuela, mm. which is also under sanctions. Right. So this is the only source of heavy crude for them. And of course, as we know, gas is not that easy to substitute from mm. one country to another. Pipeline supplies are there. Yeah. Even if they get LNG to bring it in and supply it in the same pipe, pipe network, it's mm. not going to be easy. Mm. They just don't have that ability right yeah. now. So the question again is, how will they pay for the gas, which they have not sanctioned, so therefore technically it's open. Will it mean that Russia therefore will get the money, mm. but it will also be frozen? frozen. So right. these are open questions which have, the, as of now, there are very little answers on that. Mm. Or is it that those banks which have not been sanctioned then can trade or export, import in dollars mm. or euros so that through those banks then Russia can continue its foreign exchange dealings? These are the questions that are still there. Mm. It's not at the moment clear what's going to happen because this has, ta has taken place over the ten, last 10 days. Mm. Now, on the, you know, after 10 days, we are trying to, we are seeing some, sh the contours of sanctions emerge, mm. but how it will practically play out is still an open question. And at the end of it, you know, if you hold money and freeze it, 
Mm. What you are also doing is that the amount of money available to the Western financial system yeah. also dries up. Yeah. Whatever you do, it's Absolutely. frozen. Yeah. Therefore, a whole bunch of things where this money would have been used. Mm. Bank does not just have assets and sit on it. Mm. It uses it in other things. Yeah. That's how banks That's operate. How banks work. It's your and my money. Yeah. So how would those... Those assets, if they were in play and they are frozen, mm. means you have $400 billion taken out of the global economy. Mm. Now That's a huge, huge, huge issue, amount. huge yeah. blow. And how will the banks then handle it? How will the Western economies and the global economy bear this is still a very, very open question. Mm. I expect that you are really going to see a downturn of the economies yeah. as much as the pandemic did, yeah. as because of the action that mm. we are taking. That's independent of what else can happen during nuclear armed states, which is what we are seeing in play at the moment. Right. And I think we'll we'll continue or have you back as as some of these things unfold later in the week and and next week as well to look at also the impact that it has on economies in the south specifically because we're all impacted by it in different ways. Uh, thanks so much for the update, Prabir. And finally, in a strongly worded statement, the United Nations Security Council labeled the Houthis as a terrorist group, despite human rights groups warning against such a move due to its adverse humanitarian and diplomatic consequences for the civilian population of Yemen. For more on this subject, I spoke earlier via video conference to Abdul, who's been covering the story. Abdul, uh, the subject we were discussing with our previous guest, Prabir, was, uh, was on the Western imposed sanctions on Russia, as well as the impact that they will have uh, for the global economy. Uh, in that context, this, this United Nations Security Council vote uh, takes on a sense of irony, uh, hypocrisy as well, that I guess has to be observed. Uh, Tell us how, how uh, the vote proceeded and the details of what happened at the UNSC. Uh, I think the facts are quite obvious. The, out of 15 members in the Security Council, 11 voted be, to basically uh, extend the embargo on uh, Houthis. The, the only difference this time, this uh, embargo is old. It was first introduced in 2015. The only difference this time is, uh, apart from earlier, it was only for few leaders some of the leaders of the Houthis, now it is extended to the entire group. Why? Right. The second thing is uh, the resolution also, uh, for the first time, uh, talks about uh, Houthis being a terrorist organization, which is the basic, uh, uh, you can say, the issue of contention, because uh, Norway, which abstained from voting, uh, 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 quoted that the, 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 the word terrorism is not defined, and which can lead to multiple kind of interpretations, and it is basically ham can hamper the humanitarian a situation uh, the groups who are working in uh, uh, Yemen at Yemen. this moment, their work will have will be hampered. So, despite all those vagueness, the re resolution was passed. Ironically, uh, with uh, support of Russia and all, uh, mm. uh, which is to some extent surprising. Uh, some media groups were saying that this is a kind of bargain between Russia and um, uh, UAE, which uh, that UAE will vote abstain uh, on the UN resolution, UN General Assembly right. resolution, which did not happen. You mm -hmm. voted in favor of the resolution. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do not know what happened behind the curtains, but uh, it is a very ironic uh, picture at this moment where a, uh, the group which is defending uh, its territory from external aggression has mm -hmm. been basically has been subjected to arms embargo, but the group which is uh, uh, attacking Yemen uh, for last five years has, has not been subjected to the similar kind of uh, embargo, which is a very uh, strange case in, in this scenario. Not just that, Abdul, but it also has the tacit support of the United Nations Security Council uh, in this case. Uh, going on from there, uh, a little bit to talk about the humanitarian situation in Yemen, because the key concern here is what sort of impact uh, this labeling of the Houthis as a terrorist group, as well as the continued embargo, uh, will have on humanitarian exercises like you were mentioning in brief. Uh, can you uh, talk about that in some further detail, please? Of course. Uh, um, last time, last last year, when the uh, you, uh, Trump administration was going out of power, at the last on the last day, it imposed it basically termed Houthis as a terrorist organization, which basically led to a, a very grave situation in Yemen. Uh, all the uh, groups, which international groups, which were operating in Yemen, 
had to negotiate, had to do deal with Houthis uh, because Houthis control the majority of the areas where the majority of the population in Yemen lives. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, you cannot operate in those areas if you have you are not dealing with Houthis in some way or another. Mm -hmm. But if you are dealing with dealing with Houthis uh, in any ways, you will come under the sanctions imposed by uh, uh, the United States uh, or now the Security Council if it is called uh, a terrorist organization then mm. you will be accused of dealing with a terrorist organization, which exactly. can lead to uh, forfeitment of your uh, funds and, uh, and so on and so forth. Because of that, because of the fear of that uh, labeling of dealing with a terrorist organization, majority of the humanitarian agencies refrain from engaging uh, there. Mm -hmm. It means that ultimately the millions of Yemenis who, are, uh, who, who, who lack basic food, uh, medicine, and other basic uh, facilities, uh, immunity uh, will not have access to it because there is no. Uh, we know that Yemen is also as, uh, uh, subjected to a comprehensive air, sea, and land blockade imposed by uh, Saudi Arabia led coalition. Mm. Uh, and therefore, there is no external trade happening between mm. Yemen and the rest of the world apart from the humanitarian aid, which is aid that is coming in. flowing through these organizations. So mm -hmm. if they are also scared of dealing with the UT administration there, it means millions of Yemenis will be in a very dire situation. They will, the situation which is already the world's, uh, the gravest situation in humanitarian terms will become even uh, graver. So that basically should have been thought about when the, such words are loosely introduced in, uh, in resolutions in a body which is which is assigned to maintain the peace in the world. So that is a very grave situation at this moment. And it may also perhaps set precedence in terms of international law. All right, thanks very much, Abdul. That's all the time we have today. That's all we have for today. For more on these and other stories being covered by People's Dispatch, head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Also give us a follow on all the regular social media platforms uh, for updates. We will be back again, same time, same place tomorrow, hopefully with some better news. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.